Hello, this is Daniel Meyer, pastor of First Baptist Church of River Falls, Wisconsin. It's great to have you all tuning in. I hope that these next few minutes are a blessing to all of you and that you hear from God as I relay this message that he has given to me to give to you. This morning, I encourage you to turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter number three. Isaiah chapter number three. I almost preached this last week, but I thought it would be fitting perhaps to wait until after the election. It tends to be a little more prophetic this way, uh, but God's in control. Uh, as you study the Bible, you learn uh, several things about nations. You should recognize that we live in this time in our nation. The nation's been around for 250 years. It's a long time for it to be in existence. And so we are no longer living in the, in the childhood of our nation. We're not living in the teenage years of our nation. We're living in the twilight years of our nation. They just don't, they just don't last very long. And we find as you study the Bible, you find that boy Isaiah had his finger on Judah. He, he knew exactly what Judah was going through and where they were at. And as we find in this chapter is both very prophetic and very applicable to our lives today. Judah's in view and the temple of God, but one can see the very application today of our churches and our nations. The very fact that someone desires to, to, be the, to have the ruin of someone else's watch is very frightening, as we'll see this morning. It speaks of an anti-spirit of responsibility that's so prevalent in our society today. I mean, just think about an anti-spirit of responsibility. No one, no one wants to be responsible for, for anything. And yet we can see, boy, this is exactly what's taking place in, in Judah. It's here that the Lord was ready to remove all the pillars of the state. And we'll read about some 14 uh, types of people that he just removes from, from Judah. And as we're going to read this chapter, uh, chapter 3, just know that in less than 200 years, the very T, Prophet Jeremiah confirms uh, the famine that comes and confirms all the desolation that takes place. And while the list might appear to be random, I assure you it's not random. It's not. The rise of the rule of children, the immature, the unlearned, those that lack experience, those that lack valor, those that lack honor, those that lack wisdom is so evident here in Judah and yet so evident in society today as you, as you look and see who's there and who's, who's running and who's, who's leading. Just sounds a lot like our current optical environment. That's what you see. When the Lord does this, what was once a competent becomes incompetent and it becomes capricious. Yet one need not observe. As soon you'll find this is taking place in not only churches, but cities and states across this nation. Isaiah chapter 3, verse number 1. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient, the captain of fifty, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, and the eloquent order. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. They show their countenance doth witness against them and they declare their sin as Sodom and they hide it not. Woe unto their soul for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous and that it shall be well with him for they shall eat the fruit of their doing. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee to cause thee to err, and destroy thy way of thy pass, the Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. 
This morning we're going to take a look about this, this ruin that's going to befall Judah. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you to help us this morning. Help us to make application. We recognize this exactly what happened to the nation. Uh, Judah, Lord, they had fallen. Jerusalem was conquered. And yet, Lord, there's so many parallels that we can see in today's life and today's church. We ask that you just help us to, to read and see and understand perhaps maybe where we're headed. Lord, that we might be able to serve you with the days that we have left in all earnestness. Lord, we have recognized where we are. We ask these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. It's going to be a very hard message uh, for me. This is matter of fact, in verse number one, this is the, the fifth prophecy that Isaiah gives. Notice that he's talking about the, the staff and stay of bread, the whole staff and stay of water. Bread is commonly called the staff of life. You read about it in Leviticus 26 and Exodus chapter 14. And water is obvious, so needful in our, in our life. And yet, as you'll see, according to Jeremiah chapter 52, verse number 6, boy, this is fulfilled in the fourth month of the ninth day. The famine comes, the sore famine comes, and Judah doesn't have any food, and they don't have any water. And yet we can make the application today that it's also a spiritual application, and that that bread and that water is symbolic of the Word of God, which we seem to be lacking. Both cases, when you lack real food, and you lack spiritual food, there's a famine that comes in the land so prevalent because people are hungry people need to be fed people desire to hear from god now we have plenty of food today praise the lord we have plenty of bread today and yet earlier this year when that uh they started the the pandemic you were limited on how many loaves of bread you could buy you were limited on toilet paper you were limited on how many how much you could just buy in the store that's kind of a, a precursor to where where our nation is is headed it has to. History fulfills itself over and over and over again. And if it happened to Israel, the northern ten tribes, and it happened to the southern tribes, rest assured it's going to happen some point here. Now, I don't want it to happen, and I don't think it's going to happen maybe in my lifetime, but I wouldn't be surprised if it does. This famine. Famine for the the bread, famine for hearing the word of God, famine for those things. And God's going to take it away. God's the one that's in control. He gives the rain on the just and the unjust. He provides the increase in the field. He provides the decrease in the field just the same. All based on our approach to him, all based on our relationship with him. And here he's talking about this, this coming famine. Now you keep your finger there and turn to Amos chapter number Amos is a he's just a country boy that's the best way to describe him he was just working for his dad in the orchard God called him he's the oldest prophet called notice what he says here in this book Amos chapter 8 verse 11 he says behold the days come saith the Lord God that I will send a famine in the land and not a famine of bread nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. Amos is talking about a people that are going to be hungry looking for the word, hungry looking for that life-flowing water. I would submit to you that we live in a different day and a different time. People aren't running across the country looking for a church that preaches the word of God. They're not looking to hear the, the word of God. These people were, were hungry for it. These people desired it. Today we live where people would rather just sit. They just sit. God tells them back here through Isaiah that he's going to take it away. And not only is he going to take the staff, and not only is he going to take the stay, right? A stay is something that you, you lean on, right? You, you, you lean on it. It's a stay. It's solid. It's sure. It's not going anywhere. He's going to take that away. He's going to take what we, what we lean upon away. We get to verse number two, detailing all these, these people that he, he's going to take away. He's going to take away mighty men. You know who they are? They're veterans. He's going to take away veterans. Veteran, somebody who's already engaged in combat. Veterans got experience in combat. 
God said he's just going to take the veteran away. He said he's going to take away the man of war, active duty soldiers. Just going to take him away. He said he's going to take away the judge. That's a magistrate. That's a name that's applied to the person who inter intervenes and presides over an affair. Do you know that the last president, when he left office, left over 100 unfulfilled judicial seats? Maybe, maybe God was preparing a nation just to, just to remove those judges. Maybe. America doesn't care for its veterans anymore. America doesn't care for its active duty soldiers anymore. Judges, I'm thankful for the last president to be able to fulfill so many seats. But boy, he's taking them away. Not only is he going to take away the judges, he says, and the prophets. Prophets will be the, in, include the skillful and faithful teachers. Yet we have people in our land that got up and promoted one candidate and said it was okay that he believed that you could violate scripture. Just vote for him anyways. It's not a, not a prophet that you'd want to listen to. Not someone that should be saying the, the right words. And yet it seems that the, the preachers that preach the Bible and believe the Bible and proclaim the word of God. Boy, they're worse than dinosaurs. You can't find them. They become extinct. No wonder why no one's going from coast to coast looking for them. They're not there. Yet we still have a few today. It says the ancient. Boy, it says the prudent. The a prudent person is someone whose conduct matches their wisdom. Might, just, might define prudence as wisdom in action. We're fortunate that we have a few uh, prudent people here. We still have some that are able to see the, that prudence working in their lives. He goes on and says the ancient. Wisdom was increased by what? Long experience. Where, where, where's all the seasoned saints from yesteryear? Where are they? We have some, but not as many as we need. You read the book of Titus. How are young women going to learn unless the elder women teach them? How are the young men going to learn unless there's elders there to teach them and encourage them? Where are the ancients? Where are those that have lived life and walked with the Lord? Yet yeah, I think we're going to suffer severe persecution. The saints are, the ancient are. Nursing homes are full of it. Notice he says in verse 3, the captains of 50. You might want to say that's a platoon leader. You know what happens if God takes away a platoon leader? You're not going to have anybody to lead a group. You're not going to have anybody to lead any men that you might be able to muster. Previous presidency was firing generals left and right. I'm going to fire a general how long before a captain? How long before a platoon leader? How long before someone's able to engage? This is what God is going to do in Judah in short time. In less than 170 years, he's going to remove all of them. Not only is he going to remove the captain of the 50, he's going to get rid of the honorable men, the wise and learned. Right? Judges used to be a, a position of reverence. Doctors used to be a position of reverence. Pastors used to be a, a position of reverence. Business owners used to be that, that position, used to be honorable. Not anymore. Honor's all gone. We've removed all the place of birthright. We've removed all the place of power. Reputation's all gone. Obviously, the counselors are going to have to go too. Wise and learned. We can't have wise and learned people in society today. The cunning artificer. I'm just going to tell you as a, as a craftsman. Right? As a, as a master plaster that I was. I still failed at the skill that my predecessors had. Today, those in the trades don't have the same skill that they had 100 years ago. Where are the cunning artificers? They're gone. Today, we manufacture buildings on this precept of, really, they're going to remodel it in five years so you don't have to do very good quality. There's no craftsmanship. Just hurry up and get it done. We're going to remodel in a few years anyways. These cunning artificers could make either ornaments for times of peace or instruments of war. The counselor, the cunning artificer, the eloquent order. That's a hired lawyer, an advocate. We still have them, but they're getting hard to find good ones. They're becoming fewer and fewer. Notice he says in verse number four, and I will give children 
to be their princes. Children, uneducated. First time in modern history that we've had, we've had a group of children go almost a whole calendar year and not really be taught. They closed the schools back in March because of COVID and maybe they've done some distance learning then and maybe they're doing some now, maybe they're doing some in-person learning. But boy, it's almost a full calendar year that, that children growing up have limited education. I assure you 20 years from now, we'll reap the benefit of that. There won't be any benefit to reap, but we'll reap the reward. Babes, obviously millions aborted, but babes shall rule over them. You see it today in society. You see the immature nature of those that are in power. Those that have real power rule that way. And the people, and the people shall be oppressed, everyone by another. Boy, do we, is that all we see today? Neighbor against neighbor, family member against family member. This oppression keeps going. There's generational tensions. Boy, there's societal tensions. There's familial tensions. All problematic in society. Now, just look back at chapter 2 for just a minute. Isaiah chapter 2, verse number 6. He says, Therefore thou hast forsaken the people of the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines and they please themselves in the children of strangers. We see here in verse number six, we see the national sins that Judah suffers. I think America suffers the same. Notice they're influenced by others that come from the east. Just so, just in case you're curious, China's not in the west. China's the far east. Just to give you an idea. They had intermarried with other nations and had produced many strange children. They violated the word of God. They had multiplied riches and increased their treasures like we talked about last week with choosing a king. They, Judah had done all these things. They had multiplied horses and chariots. They're not supposed to. Their land was full of idols and false gods. They worshiped the works of their own hands. And the common man and the great man both bowed down themselves to idols. Is that not where we are today? Is our land not full of idols? If you do any kind of traveling and stay in any hotels nationwide, you'll find it hard to find a, a hotel or motel that's run by a Christian. You'll find most of them run by some pagan. There'll be some pagan idols in that thing all the time. They have little prayer rooms set up for their, for their idols all across this land. These are the national sins of, of Judah. This is why God is judging Judah in chapter 3. This is why the prophet is telling the nation, this is exactly what's going to happen. All oppression, back in chapter 3, verse number 6. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. Clothing is supposed to be fit for a prince, a badge of honor. Some apparel may produce thee for request. Perhaps it's a figure of speech, and it is. Idea is it's rhetoric and it's reversed. That is, let this ruin, you have repaired what ruin? One might say it this way to give you an idea of what he's talking about. A restless night. It wasn't a restless night, but those who didn't sleep thought it was. It's exactly what he's saying here. He's saying, when a man shall take hold of his brother, the house of his father, saying, thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. This is Judah's judgment coming. I suspect judgment's coming to America. You can't have millions of babies aborted. You can't have fraudulent elections. You can't have people in the street protesting. You can't have what we have in society today. And yet we see it. You can see the ruin coming. Daniel chapter 5 said in Babylon they can see the, the writing on the wall. Can you see the writing on the wall? I think that you can. Verse number 8. We'll skip ahead. We'll back up just a second. Verse number 8. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. 
The cause of Judah's ruin was the fact that they used their tongue in a way that didn't glorify God. I think that our speech today doesn't glorify God. We don't praise God enough. We don't give Him the glory. We use our tongue for, for different manners. God is telling us here that, boy, for misusing the tongue, here comes the, the room. Not only did they misuse their tongue, but He says that they sinned. They were sinning against the Lord. You recognize our sins are against God? Our sins are against God. Judah was full of sins, committing sins. That's why we looked at the list of the things that caused their, their sins. Their consequence that caused them to sear their conscience. They were open to sin and publicly declaring it to all. We have that in our society. You see it here. He says, he says in verse number 9, to show their countenance to witness against them, and they declared their sin as Sodom. The sin of Sodom was going after strange flesh. Yet today we have Pope that says that, boy, same-sex marriage is okay. We have a government that says same-sex marriage is okay. We have churches that say same-sex marriage is okay. And God says it's not. God says they openly showed their sins like, like Sodom. Judah is doing this. This isn't Babylon, this isn't Assyria, it's not Egypt, this is Judah. They've got the temple of God, they've got the ark of God, they've got the high priest, they're going in. And yet their sins are open and publicly declaring it before all. They also rewarded evil unto themselves. wonder how many times America rewards evil unto itself. It's sad that our police wind up shooting criminals. And yet every time it happens, there's a protest. Every time that happens, the city is burned to the ground. I suspect we're rewarding evil to ourselves. There's got to be a better way to police. There's got to be a better way to uphold the law. There's got to be a better way. And yet we fail to find it year after year. Same, same things were taking place in Judah. Verse number 7. And that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer. Where, 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 where are the healers? I'm not talking about physical healing. I'm talking about spiritual healing in our land. I'm talking about someone saying, boy, that's wrong. God says that's wrong. You've got to get right. You've got to trust in God. And God's going to make it work in your life. But what you're doing is wrong. Alcoholism's on the rise, drug addiction's on the rise, murder's on the rise, fornication's on the rise, divorce is on the rise. Where's the healer that says, that's wrong? What does God say? Where is the word of the Lord? This man here says, boy, it's beyond repair. I wonder, is our nation beyond repair? Tensions are so tight right now, it's not even, it's not even funny. <laughs> excuse me we're fortunate there wasn't any rioting but just wait we're not done with the election cycle yet it's a calm right now before the storm there's something coming I wonder is our nation beyond being healed but guess what the nation's not capable of healing itself the healing's got to come from the Word of God. The healing's got to come from God's church, taking the Word of God and ministering to people in a way that they can see that their needs are going to be met, that God is able to heal them, God's able to forgive them, God's able to love them, even in a sinful condition. And Judah's not doing that. How is it that we have states that just voted for legalizing hard, hard drugs? Hard drugs. If the election holds true, it won't take too long before prostitution is legalized. And if prostitution is legalized, can someone share with me the OSHA handbook on that? And how is, how is that going to be legalized? And how is that trade going to work? And how is the taxes going to work on that? That's another, that's another sure indication this is exactly where we're at, this ruination of a nation. Because Judah did the same thing. Judah tried to legalize all the sins that God said didn't work. That God said was an abomination to him. And yet Judah legalized them. 
If a nation can't be healed from a spiritual healer, boy, all the ruin's going to come. He says, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Well, how fitting if we make the spiritual application. Bread be the word of God. There's no bread. And if there's no clothing, then there's what? No salvation. There's no righteousness. There's no things of God. He says, make me not a ruler of the people. For Jerusalem is ruined. The ruin of Judah, all their food is gone. All the food is gone. If they put us on lockdown for eight to ten weeks, how long is the food going to last? Not very long. All the water is gone. We're lacking water all the time. They have massive droughts out west. Always looking for water. The 14 classes are all judged, all those people, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, all those are all judged, all taken away. You wind up with a nation that's ruled by babes and children. Is that what we have right now? Well, just print more money. Just print more money. Just tax the wealthy. That's not an answer. People oppress one another. We see that protesting, rioting. They lack respect one for another. I just watched a, a protest video from election night out west. And the group was marching and the guy's like, hey, see my sign? I voted for the right guy. And the protester said, you can't tell us how we're going to protest. If we want to burn your property to the ground, we'll burn it to the ground. It's a lack of respect for an elder. He was an elderly man. But if you won't respect the elders, you certainly won't respect the honorable. And then my favorite is, is no one accepts responsibility for their actions. Is that not where we are? A nation, what, $126 trillion in debt that they won't tell you about? And no one wants to take responsibility? And let's, let's keep printing stimulus money. We've got to help the people. While burying us in debt that we can't ever pay is not helping. Why not take responsibility and say, look, we're in debt. We can't help you. They won't say that. No one will accept responsibility and no one accepts the responsibility for the ruination of judah here there's no priest that comes forward and says look i'm sorry we haven't been teaching the word of god like we're supposed to no no the bible says they moved the house of the sodomites right next to the temple of god it's exactly where we are refusing to accept responsibility we've got to learn to accept responsibility right if you're if you're caught speeding what do you say Oh, I'm sorry, I, my, my, my throttle was stuck. I'm sorry, I was doing 40 over in the speed zone. I, it's my throttle, don't blame me. It's, I, I've got a big motor in my car. It can't be my fault. I didn't pay my taxes. Oh, it's not my fault. It's my tax guy's fault. We've got to get to a place where we learn to accept responsibility for our actions. That would mean living our life in a manner that would glorify God. And when God says that's wrong, say, you're right, God, I'm wrong. Help me live that life the way that you would have me to lead, live it. It's the nation gone too far to be saved. Judah's not saved. Judah never makes a recovery. So as I read this in my, ba my daily Bible study, my daily Bible reading, I read this. I'm like, this is exactly where we are in America. This is exactly where the church is at. Churches closing up shop all the time because they can't find somebody to pass. Boy, it's got no electricity. It's got no funds. It's got no people. And they want, here, you just take this. Take what? Where's the previous pastor? Judah here, where's the priest? How come they're not teaching? Bible says they were supposed to be teaching priests. What are they supposed to be teaching? They're supposed to be teaching the precepts of the word of God. We learned the precepts of the word of God. We wouldn't find a nation so far gone that it can't be saved. And you know the nation is so far gone it can't be saved because men are too poor here to help others. We're not quite there yet. But we're close. We're close. We can still help but we can't help the way that we should be able to help. Homelessness is on the rise.
Crimes on the rise. Prophets just preaching away here. Showing the nation how bad they are. And as I said, this all takes place, or the, the culmination all takes place in Jeremiah chapter 52, verse number 6. 170 years later, and you know what? Judah didn't respond. They didn't get right. They just kept adding more and more and more things. Isaiah preaches 19 woes. Here in chapter 3, verse number 9, he's got a woe to the, the homosexual crowd. In verse 11, he, he's got a woe to the wicked. Verse 11, woe to the wicked. It shall be ill with him that reward of his hand shall be given him. He's got a woe to the covetous. He's got a woe to the drunkards. He's got a woe to those that carry a heavy laden of sin. He's got woe that are called evil good and good evil. He just goes right down the list, just hammering on a people and they don't respond to the word of God. You know what? Our nation's not responding to the word of God either. But if we want to save our nation, the people got to respond to the word of God. A president can't save the nation. The government can't save the nation. You know who can save the nation? Jesus Christ is the only one that can save the nation. Because he can work in the hearts and lives of those that live in that nation. And he can change all of this wickedness. All of this evil. He can restore it all. But the problem is, is the people won't serve Jesus. They won't look to Jesus. They look to everything else. They look for a government handout. They look for government to be able to solve all their problems and insurance. And instead of looking to God. Judah's in real trouble. I submit America's in real trouble. Verse number 9. To show their countenance. Doth witness against them. I mean our, our countenance just witness against us. Everywhere you go you can see it witnessing against us. That as a nation we're getting farther and farther and farther away from the precepts of God. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. No one hides their sin anymore. They don't hide their sin. It's all out in the open. We glorify it on television. Got TV shows about Teen Mama and all, all the kids that they have. I mean, it's just, it's just prevalent. We're just going to glorify it. Oh, I want to be on that program. And they wonder, well, where's the parents? Where are they? Where's the church? Say to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. We're going to eat the fruit of our doings. We're going to be rewarded for the calamity that's coming. Man, that's going to be some nasty stuff I don't want to have to eat. But you want to know what? When we find ourselves in that place, and we are there, Luke chapter 15, like the prodigal son, right? Looking at that pig slop, looking at those husks in the, in the slop just going through, we can still cry out to God. He was spared from living that life. He was spared from eating from that pig trough. God could spare our nation. He spared Nineveh. He gave Nineveh an extra 150 years because they responded to the preaching of Jonah. Well, where's our nation at? Sure hope we're not hungry. Sure hope we're not looking for this fruit that's coming down the, the pig slop. I don't want to eat it. Verse 11, woe to the wicked, it should be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. I mean, we're rewarded for our action. That's why I start out with Psalm 106, verse 15. The leanness that comes. God sends all of these things one by one to the nation. So that the people would respond and go to God and go to the temple and pray and seek God's face. Second Corinthians or Second Chronicles chapter 7, right? Humbling themselves, praying to God. Our nation is so, so far gone. There's no humility in the people. There's no humbleness in the people. There's no people willing to, to get on their knees and pray to God and ask God to save the nation. We're going to get what's due to us. Verse 12, ask for my people. My people. Children are their oppressors. And women rule over them. Now, I'm not, I'm not against women. I'm not. God has a special place for women. 
God's got a special ministry for women. You can start looking in the Bible and every time there's a powerful woman, the reason why there's a powerful woman that's on the scene is because there's a bunch of weak kneed, lily livered men that won't stand up and do what God told them to do. The clear sign that extreme weakness of a nation is the fact that there's women in leadership because there's not men taking charge and doing what God called them to do. The woman's a weaker vessel. The woman's supposed to be like a piece of china. The woman's supposed to be loved and cherished and she's not built for all the stress that comes in, in these positions of power. And God is telling them right here, boy, there's going to be women that are going to rule over you. Lacks experience. Man, we're in real trouble as a nation. We are. We're in real trouble as a nation because the men have allowed this nation to get to the place where we won't call evil evil and we won't call good good. It's the men. That's where, that's where it's at. It's not, a, it's not against the women. It's against the men. Oh, my people. They which lead thee cause thee to err. Who is leading our nation? What's the spiritual barometer of our nation and where is it leading us to? Like that old illustration. The best way to boil a live frog is to put him on a pot and turn the burner on low. And then slowly turn it up. That frog has no idea that he's being cooked alive. Ask yourself the question, where's our nation being led? I think we're in the pot. Wonder what the water temperature is. We're led by sinful leaders. Sinful leaders lead us to places that are, that are, that are bad. So the question always comes back to the church. Where, where's the preaching? Or where, where's the word of God? Where's the men of God that are standing on the precepts of God's word? Proclaiming God's word. Encouraging the people to, to live a godly life. Turn to Isaiah chapter 24. It says, Behold, verse number one, the Lord maketh the earth empty. And maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be, as with the people, so with the priests. As with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with the mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury of him. The land shall be utterly empty and utterly spoiled. For the Lord has spoken it. You want to know what's going on? Is leadership's allowing the people to dictate where we go. It's the people. There is no leadership. The leadership succumb to the people. Oh, I got to be on this side. Oh, wait, I got to be on this side. It's blown this way. That's exactly what's happening. The people with the priests, the priests are allowing the people to dictate what, what, what they think is acceptable, what they want. And it goes right down the list. The employer is allowing the, the employees to dictate. There's, there's, no, there's no leadership. There's no leadership from top all the way to the bottom. And it all stems from the fact that no one's preaching God's word. That's how we find ourselves in the condition we're at right now. Where the election's contested. There might be some malfeasance. I use the word might loosely. But this is exactly what the people want. And if this is exactly what the people want, God's going to give us exactly what he gave Judah. And in short fashion, we'll cease to be a nation. The choice is up to you and me. We have to go to God. We have to beg God. We have to... Seek God. Turn to Second Chronicles chapter 7. 
was the only hope for the nation Israel. It's the only hope for America. He says there in verse 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. You know, I know what? America is a really prideful nation. America is full of people that are really prideful. I think it's very hard for Americans to humble themselves. Just like it was very hard for the, the Hebrews to humble themselves. They looked at all the prosperity that God had given them and the temple and the, the fortress and all the miracles of God's provision and God's defense. We could say the same about our nation. Very hard for a people to humble themselves when they have all that we have. And pray. Not pray to the government. Not pray to the electoral college. Not pray to the, maybe there's malfeasance. Maybe there's fraud. Maybe it'll be exposed. No, no, pray to God. That God can fix it. That God would fix it. He says, and seek my face. That's what we're not doing as a people. That's what Judah wasn't doing. Wasn't seeking after God. And turn from their wicked ways. Americans like their wicked ways. Ticed and encapsulated and enchanted by all of our wicked ways. And because we're too prideful, and because we don't want to pray, and because we don't want to seek God's face, how are we going to hear from heaven? And he says, and he'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Boy, boy, what, whatever is going to take place in the next months is not going to be good. One way or the other. But God has given us as a people exactly what we Asked for. Now, I didn't ask for it, and you didn't ask for it, but somebody asked for it, and their cries were louder, and their cries were heard, because maybe they were pleading to their God. Maybe they were pleading to the God, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4, the God of this world. And they got their prayers answered by hook or crook. But our prayers aren't answered by hook or crook. Our prayers are by humbly going to God and confessing our sin, 1 John 1, 9, and pleading with God and asking God, would he heal our land? Because if he won't heal our land, then we're, we're, we're done for. And no amount of you searching from coast to coast, looking for someone that's preaching the word of God, it's going to help because you're not going to find it. Because it's almost non-existent. You should hear the reports of some people that really can't find a church. They look and they look. There's people in this town that won't even go to church. There's people within listening area that could drive here that don't go to church. They claim that they can't find a good church. They claim that there's not a good church. And they're not looking for a church. They've just given up looking for a church. Then we wonder why are we have all this calamity? Why our streets are filled with blood? Why murder's on the rise? Man, we're a sinful people. And people aren't hungry for the word of God. And if we're not hungry for the word of God, we're not going to plead with God. We're not going to seek God's face. I'm thankful that God's doing some great things here. I'm thankful that we see some people that are really hungry for the word of God. But some people just aren't. And that's the general consensus of America. As they could take it or leave it. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 3. If we won't seek God and we won't humble ourselves before God, then this is exactly where we are. So, epistle to the Laodiceans. Verse 14, and under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert hot, cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods. 
financial aid. It doesn't really matter if there's a Democrat or Republican in, in office. The annual returns from the stock market vary between eight, eight to ten percent, and there's very little difference between the two, the two uh, candidates when they're in office. How the stock market works. That's historic. But Americans say they're rich. That's what we vote on. We vote on riches. And increase with goods. Well, we want goods. And have need of nothing. And knowest thou that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked? That's what God said we are. That's what Isaiah is telling them is coming. I'm telling you we're in the same predicament. We're in the same boat. Our nation is. And our churches are even worse. Our churches are exactly like this. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness doth not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You know what? We don't see what's going on. We don't see what's going on with sin. We don't see what's going on in our nation. We don't see what's going on in our church. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, because zeal be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Our churches are so depraved that God is outside the church, and the church won't even let him inside for worship. They don't have time. He can't come in for the song service. He can't come in from the prayer time. He can't come in for the preaching time. He can't come in for fellowship time. He's outside. The Laodiceans have moved him outside. You know what our nation is doing with God? We're moving God outside our boundaries, outside our borders. We don't want him. That's what we're saying as a people. And you tell me how long before God just comes through and destroys us as a people. 65 million babies, countless other crimes against humanity, against God, against your neighbor, against parents. And we still won't humble ourselves. We still won't let him in. He says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him. Can you hear God calling? Can you hear God talking and pleading with the nation, with the church, with you, with your life, with your family? Can you hear him? Is he pleading? I think that he is. Our problem is we just won't hear. Our problem is, is we just won't listen. He says in verse 22, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Hope that you can hear. Hope that you can actually hear what God is doing. Lest we be like the man in verse number six and says, let this ruin be on, on you. It's not on me. Not on me. I don't accept it. I, I, I don't accept it. Someone else did it. Someone else caused it. Kind of like when your children get in trouble. They do something disobedient and you catch them. And you ask them, they're like, wasn't me, it was, they weren't home. Maybe your kids weren't like that. My kids were like that. My, my kids would bite themselves on the arm and then blame the other sibling. And then you'd have to look at the teeth mark and go, no, no. he would have had to have, really? You can tell that? Yeah, can't you see the marks? It's... No one wants to accept responsibility. The downfall of our nation is ultimately our responsibility. It's our fault. God says that judgment's first going to come at the house of God. So you can see the task that we have before us. As I said last week, 1 Timothy chapter 2 says that we ought to pray that all we ought to pray to every man that what that we might live a pre, uh, that we might live a peaceable life. We have to humble ourselves to pray. We have to recognize the calamity that's so befalling our nation. You don't get to be a superpower forever. You don't get to. Assyria's gone. Egypt's gone. The Mongolian horde's gone. The Moors are gone. You want me to go on? I mean, you just go right down through history. Babylon's gone. The Persians are gone. You don't get to for eternity. There's only one and he's gone. You can see our nation, our nation being led by sinful people that leads us to a place where, boy, the prophets prophesy smooth things to appease the people. If you'd stand with me.
We have a big task as believers. We have a lot of things that we can pray for. Pray for our nation, that God would heal our nation, that he'd heal our land, that he'd solve all this racial tension, all this bitterness between people, between families. I mean, it's so bad that you've got people in the, in the same family, you can't even talk politics because one's on one side, one's on the other, and the insults fly. I mean, you just think, you just think how, how close we are to being just exactly like Judah. Let's pray. Father, we got a big task before us. We recognize the depravity of our nation and the calamity of sin, and we can see that we are on the doorstep of desolation. We recognize that destruction is so eminent in our nation. The amount of debt and the tension between people and the desire of principles is so far to the extreme, one from the other. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to humble ourselves, that we might come before you boldly. Lord, that we'd repent of our sins, that we'd ask you, boy, if you'd heal our land. Would you heal our land, Lord? We, we're here. We're pleading. Lord, the, the calamity is so, so bad. The things that they desire to do are so radical that it'll change the landscape of our, our, our nation and our freedom forever. But we recognize that you didn't spare Judah. You didn't spare Israel. You didn't spare Babylon or Assyria or Egypt. We recognize that's exactly how your history comes. And Lord, we just pray that you'd spare our nation. We know that you're merciful. We know that your tender mercies are, endure forever. Lord, we come this morning. We're asking that you would help us, help our nation to not go through those things. Lord, that we might not ask this ruin to be on someone else, but we'd accept responsibility. And Lord, that you'd work in our hearts. Lord, if we've excluded you from our church, Lord, we ask and invite you to come in. Lord, that you'd work in our lives, that you'd show us what's wrong in our lives, that our sin wouldn't separate us, that the sin wouldn't stop us from having fellowship, that you'd be able to commune with us. Lord, we don't want our nation to, to go down, but we know, we know where we are. We know what your word says, and we know what we accept is acceptable, and we know what you call is abomination. Lord, we pray that you'd help our nation, help the people. Lord, we pray, if possible, the truth would come out, that they would see the reality of where our nation is, that the people might humble themselves. Lord, we ask these things in your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen.